Um, one, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I, I want some excitement. For the students who are too far in the back, I'd like you to come up, come up, so we can just really get, get some, uh, some closeness right here. Um, I want to thank Carla for this invitation and thank everybody who is connected to UTSA uh, for this invitation to talk about um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I'm going to talk about Malcolm X, I'm going to talk about civil rights, black power, but I'm also going to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, where we're at today, movements to end mass incarceration, uh, movements for intersectional justice, which includes uh, black feminist movements. I'm going to push back and challenge people uh, in terms of this notion of diversity. We should be talking about black equality and making an argument why black equality is so important for indigenous people, for Latinx folks, uh, for white folks, for the, for the entire country. Um, I'm going to preface this talk by saying that I come to you as the proud son of Haitian immigrants who came to the United States in 1965. I'm born and raised in New York City. Um, I owe everything to my 80-year-old mother, Jermaine Joseph, who's still in the house we grew up in in Queens, New York. My mother was a trade unionist, a hospital worker at local 1199 SCIU, East 92nd Street. I was on my first picket line when I was eight years old. I grew up in a house that was concerned with social justice, with human rights. My mother is a feminist, a pan-Africanist, a Haitian historian who told us not just about Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint uh, Louverture, but she told us about the black women who were part of the Re Haitian Revolution between 1791 and 1804 that turned Haiti from a colony of slaves into a republic of free black citizens, the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere, and we really are the first revolutionary nation state to have an embargo by a U.S. president unleashed against us. In this case, it's President Thomas Jefferson, right? So when we think about um, how we all get here today to talk about Martin Luther King Jr., I am a product of that African dias diaspora that is produced by the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the New York Times had a 1619 project uh, last year, and that project was about slavery. And a lot of people were thinking to themselves, why are we talking about slavery 400 years after Jamestown? And I've had students, I've taught for over 23 years at high, in higher education, I've had students, white students, tell me, what do I have to do with racial slavery? My folks are from Ireland, they're from Italy, they're from Eastern Europe. My folks had nothing to do with racial slavery. And what I respond, because I'm a historian, so I can respond, is that what racial slavery sets up in the United States and globally is not just capitalism, but a caste system. It sets up the idea, sometimes now we call it white privilege, but it's really a system of white supremacy globally, right? So even if you were not part of that transatlantic slave trade, you are an inheritor of the, the, the politics of, and the practices of white supremacy that provide white privilege. Sometimes we call it alt-right right now. In the 1950s, we called it massive resistance. In the 1870s, we called it the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, right? But what we're talking about are the politics and practices of white supremacy, right? And so that notion of racial slavery is really important to what we're talking about today in terms of the King holiday. Because Dr. King, alongside of Malcolm X, who I'm going to talk about today, talked about racial slavery in his speeches, especially starting in 65, 66, 67, 68. I want us to remember and embrace the radical king, the revolutionary king, the king who really makes us uncomfortable, because this is a king who wants to talk about the redistribution of justice and resources in the United States and globally. This is the king who's a peace activist, not just an anti-war activist, he's a peace activist, and he's pushing us and challenging us to embrace this idea of a beloved community. And what is this beloved community? It's not a community that's just free of racial oppression, it's a community where citizens, not just in America, but globally, have rights. And I'll say this again, it's a community where citizens, and not just in the United States, have rights. And those human rights encompass what? A right to have a guaranteed living wage. So King was talking about a living wage. It's a, it's a right to have a guarantee of decent housing, a guarantee of food justice, 
Sometimes we talk about food security and environmental racism, but we always just talk about that vis-a-vis -vis white folks. The first environmental justice activists in the United States were, yes, indigenous people and African-American people. Not because black people are so special, but we've always been on the cutting edge of American democracy by virtue of our existence on the lowest rung of this society. So when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., he talks about what I call radical black citizenship in my forthcoming book, The Sword and the Shield. And I make an argument that Malcolm X talked about radical black dignity. Malcolm X is the most vocal critic of white supremacy in the 20th century. And I'll say that again. Malcolm X is the most vocal critic the boldest critic of white supremacy in the 20th century. What Malcolm X argues is that anti-black racism comprises a series of crimes against humanity. And he links those crimes to racial slavery. And right now, when we think about that 1619 project, the positive of that, the, the illuminating quality of the 1619 Project is that the way we live now is connected to racial slavery, it's connected to Jim Crow segregation, and it's continuing presence, not just aftermath, in all our lives. So it's about more than just diversity and multiculturalism. We need black equality. What King was arguing, what Malcolm was arguing with this notion of dignity and citizenship was that without black equality, America was, was doomed. Dr. King's next sermon before he's assassinated was entitled, Why America May Go to Hell in 1968. All right? There were no standing ovations for Dr. King in 1968 because by 1966 and 67 and 68, in the aftermath of the Watts uprising, and I'll say uprising, critics called it a riot, August 11th, 1965, Five days after the voting rights bill is passed, Dr. King realizes that race, democracy, citizenship is connected to state-sanctioned violence against poor, segregated black bodies in Los Angeles. And he makes a vow that he's going to connect those things to his own social movement. So when we think about Dr. King in 65, 66, 67, 68, what he's linking is what he calls the triple threats facing America and the world, materialism, racism, militarism. He says these are the gigantic evils facing America. King makes an argument in Riverside, April 4th, 1967, one year to the day of his assassination, that America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. So King links what's happening in Vietnam to racial segregation and anti-black violence in Memphis, Tennessee, in Birmingham, Alabama, in the Mississippi Delta. When we think about Malcolm X, we usually think about Malcolm X as the sword and King as the shield. I make an argument that they're both. By 1964, 65, Malcolm is embracing this idea of organizing the ballot versus the bullet. He's traveling to Africa and critiquing anti, he's critiquing colonialism in Africa and connecting anti-colonial activism in Africa in the third world to anti-racist activism at home. And that's an echo of the double V movement of the World War II era. So when we think about Malcolm and Martin, we usually think about them as dream versus nightmare, but I, I have a different conception and make a different argument. Even Dr. King's notion of an American dream and this idea of the mountaintop, August 28, 1963, March on Washington. King is making a radical speech at the March on Washington. 250,000 people there. King argues for reparations at the March on Washington. He begins that speech by saying, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. And he says that we come here today to cash a check a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the Bank of American Justice is bankrupt. That's what King argues. And he says in that speech that we are gonna to have to struggle together to get to that beloved community, that we are gonna to have to pray together, yes, but he said we're gonna to have to go to jail together. The reason he said we're gonna to have to go to jail together is that he realized that the United States was an unjust society. King makes an argument that love was what justice looked like in public. But in the context of American democracy, 
We've not yet achieved black citizenship or Latinx citizenship or indigenous citizenship. We tell ourselves the fairy tale version of the heroic period of the civil rights movement is that Rosa Parks sat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955, and then Dr. King takes up Rosa Parks' work, and then Barack Obama finished it all for us in November of 2008 when he was elected. And we have such extraordinary hubris that we have this unearned celebration. We say that we're post-racial, that it's all over, right? Even as Barack Obama, yes, it's a watershed election, but he's, presi he's presiding over an American empire that has mass incarceration, that has slow and fast death for black people, for Latinx people, for indigenous people, for LGBTQ people, for folks who are poor, for folks who are segregated. When we think about Dr. King, we don't want to think about the Dr. King who's pushing us all to do what? To transform ourselves. He's talking about nonviolence, but he's a nonviolent revolutionary. That's why by the end, Dr. King is on the outs. There are no more White House visits. There is no more photo ops with Lyndon Johnson because he's telling Lyndon Johnson that what the United States is doing in Vietnam is wrong. There can't be a great society if it's a society that's in perpetual war. Is everybody still with me? <laughs> when we think about this idea of a beloved community, a beloved community is not some, a community that's colorblind. When Dr. King says those words, he talks about the, the, the content of their character, not the color of their skin, his four children. He's making an argument that what institutional and structural racism does when we see difference, when people are undocumented, when people are another religion, we, we stereotype and attack them, not just even personally, but institutionally. We're always going to have difference, but he's making an argument that American society and democratic institutions should embrace that difference, right? What we've done 50, 55 years, 57 years later after the March on Washington, we've, we've made this notion that Dr. King was talking about colorblindness. And what we do is we invest in this idea of colorblindness. But colorblindness can be an ideology of racism, an ideology that says we are all equal, right, by decree, even though we all know the outcomes are unequal, right? So when we talk about colorblind, we shouldn't be talking about colorblindness. And we shouldn't be talking about just diversity and multiculturalism. What happened to equality? What happened to the quest for black citizenship in our own time? And King was arguing for these universal truths, and he wanted universal justice, but he made an argument that the universal had to go through the what? The particular struggles of black and brown people in the United States and globally. That's the argument. So when we think about MLK Day, and we think about what should we be talking about in 2020, over 400 years after 1619 in Jamestown? Because remember, last year was the 400th anniversary of what Malcolm X was always calling 400 years of oppression. When Malcolm talked about catching hell, he was talking about Jamestown to the present. Racial slavery. Racial slavery in the United States produces what? Global capitalism, an empire of sugar and cotton. And there's great work on this. Sam Beckert's Empire of Cotton, Craig Wilder's Ebony and Ivy, Ed Baptist, The Half Has Never Been Told. There's all this great scholarship. And what was great about the New York Times 1619 Project was getting that scholarship out into the public arena. We need to tell our students and tell ourselves the story, the real story. Because it's not necessarily a, a comforting story, but I will say, like the president just said earlier, it actually is a hopeful story in this sense. What Dr. King argues in 1967 in Riverside, at the Riverside Church in New York City, he says that it's gonna be a long, it's gonna be a bitter, but it's gonna be a beautiful struggle. That's what he argues, right? Because he makes this argument that we actually need shared sacrifice to transform American democracy. And he feels that we can do it, but we've got to be honest with ourselves. We can't be dishonest with ourselves, and we can't congratulate ourselves on things that haven't been achieved. What we're all trying to do is achieve another country, what Baldwin called another country, inside of our own. And that other country is going to be a country that is free of institutional racism, that is free 
of sexism and misogyny and violence against women. That other country, when we think about Black Lives Matter, it's connected to the march on our lives. It's connected to the women's marches. It's connected to DACA and, and, and the lives of undocumented folks. When we look at the, the Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives, the public policy agenda, which I would encourage everybody here to read, to study, what it does is center the lives of black poor, LGBTQ, black queer women who are the feminists and who are the, who are the organizers of Black Lives Matter. It centers their lives and it connects these movements of mass incarceration and mass deportation. It says that we are all in this together, but we have to understand the folks who are being disproportionately wounded and punished are black and brown bodies. The teenagers who are being sexually trafficked in the United States are black and brown girls. Those who are the biggest victims of domestic violence, even in a country where there's, a, 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 there's supposed to be protection against women, who are being abused, it's black and brown women, right? Those who are cash poor and disproportionately HIV positive and who need mental health, mental health facilities, who are drinking water that's unclean beyond Flint, Michigan, it's black and brown bodies. Those who are being separated from their children because they're undocumented and they're coming to U.S. borders because U.S. foreign policy has destroyed the infrastructure of their nation states in Central America and Latin America and the Caribbean are black and brown bodies. So when we think about the way we live now in 2020, we have to be able to understand the story of us. It's not somebody else's story. It's our own story. We have to understand that after the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, we had a period of reconstruction that was supposed to be a literal and figurative reconstruction of American democracy, and that faltered through racial violence, anti-black violence, white supremacy. It's not just lynching. And I love Bryan Stevenson. I admire Bryan Stevenson. I love the, the African American Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. But it's the tip of the iceberg, those 4,000 souls. Tens of thousands of African-American women, men, and children were murdered and extinguished in the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s, and the early 20th century. Tulsa, Oklahoma is just the tip of the iceberg. East Elaine, Arkansas, St. Louis, Chicago, Atlanta, 1906, where W.E.B. Du Bois passes by a butcher shop where there's a black man's knuckles Sam Holes are on display, and Du Bois, who's the first black Harvard PhD, has a nervous breakdown after seeing this. This is America, and we've got to embrace that in all its fullness to understand a way out. That's why I admire Dr. King so much. Dr. King, as he evolves, is unblinking and unflinching in his understanding of the depth and the breadth of our struggle. The Poor People's Campaign isn't just a little lobbying movement to say, hey, we want a guaranteed income and we want a minimum wage. The Poor People's Campaign is King making an argument that we're going to take Mexican American, Native American, poor whites from Appalachia, but they start in Marks, Mississippi. And the reason they start in Marks, Mississippi, is that Marks is the poorest zip code in the United States. And when Dr. King visits Marks, Mississippi, in 19, late 67, early 68, he's in tears when he sees that at the Head Start program in Marks, Mississippi, there are hundreds of African-American children with no shoes. There are parents who are saying they cannot find a job and they don't have blankets for the cold. And King says that this must and will stop right here now, and he vows to start the mule train to Washington, D.C. in Marks, Mississippi. But what King also does in front of those poor people is he gives them a history lesson. He says that this same country that's telling you to pull yourselves up by the bootstraps had a Homestead Act for white immigrants. This same country provides subsidies for farmers, right? Agricultural Adjustment Act and New Deal. And remember, black farmers were left out of that finally did a settlement with the federal government during the Obama administration. He says, the same country that's telling you to pull yourself up by your bootstrap provides this extraordinary infrastructure, right, for, 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 for its white citizens, yet it tells you to pull yourselves up by, by your bootstraps. He also talks about the land theft 
that African Americans faced. Billions of dollars in land that was stolen. ta Coates talks about some of this in the Case for Reparations article, right? So this is, the, this is the, the reality that we must face. So if we're talking about social justice, if we're talking about economic justice, if we're talking about gender justice, if we're talking about justice for LGBTQ, the lesson for King and Malcolm's lives, right? This idea of citizenship on the one hand and dignity on the other. And how do we converge that? And the way we converge it is first finding out the story. Yes, we have commonalities, but we have to find out what are these commonalities. Yes, we can have coalitions and be allies, but we can only have coalitions and be allies if we're willing to tell the truth. If we're willing to tell the truth. Yes, we are all created equal in the eyes of the creator, but in this country, we are not. And I'll say it again, in this country, we are not. The biggest fallacy we are being told is that black citizenship has been achieved and that everything that happens after is your own fault. And that's what the Moynihan Report said in 1965, right? It smeared black women. It said our families were pathological. It said that something was genetically wrong with our DNAs. And most folks here in the United States still articulate that. So we don't have to, we don't have to confront structural racism. We don't have to confront the Kerner Report in 1968 saying the, the country was two nations, black, and I would say Latinx now and not just black and white, but divided, separate, unequal. We don't have to confront any of that. And when we think about the white folks in the room, I saw that Joaquin Phoenix at the BAFTAs talked about structural racism, the actor, Joaquin Phoenix of jo Joker, where he told a whole bunch of white folks that what we're doing is wrong. That's a start. <laughs> That's a start. But then you've got to say, practically, how, how can we apply restitution? How can we apply equality and justice and equity and fairness? But a start is acknowledging it. We live in a country right now, on whatever side of the political divide you are, we do not, we do not acknowledge reality. And we're also not telling our young people the story. So just because racial slavery ended in 1865, as we've seen with the Ava DuVernay documentary, The 13th, it ended except in cases of people who are incarcerated. So it continues to extend. These are not just echoes. These aren't echoes. Mass incarceration, mass deportation. Michelle Alexander just had the great New York Times piece saying, the injustice of this moment is not an aberration. It is not an aberration, and it is up to us Right? It is up to us to confront that and organize, educate, agitate around the reality of this moment. Acknowledge black women's activism, especially black feminist queer activism that is really pushing us towards intersectional justice that has a long history. We're talking about not just Ida B. Wells, we're talking about Mariah Stewart and Sojourner Truth and Frances Harper. We're talking about Nanny Helen Burroughs, Lorraine Hansberry, right? but also the social justice movement activists like a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who led, but also were led by black women and grassroots activists. There is no Martin Luther King Jr. without Fannie Lou Hamer. There is no Dr. King without Ella Baker. These are the folks who, and by the way, two days ago was the 60th anniversary of the lunch counter sit-ins. And the lunch counter sit-ins were about trying to transform American democracy. Ella Baker, the organizer of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, she, she reminded her young charges. They were 18, 19, 20 years old, Easter weekend of 1960. And they organized because on February 1st, there were four black students from North Carolina A&T who sat at a lunch counter, four. And by the end of the week, it's gonna to turn to 30. By that spring, there's over 30,000 students across the United States who are, sit in, who are sitting in across all kinds of places, not just Woolworths, and Woolworths should be a landmark right here in San Antonio across the street from the Alamo, not just the Woolworths, but in all kinds of places they were sitting in, but Ella Baker reminded them it's not about a hamburger. She said, this is about more than just a hamburger. This was about small d democracy that did not exist in the United States. There is no second class citizenship in a democracy. And we have to remind ourselves that. We have to constantly remind ourselves of the story. All right, <laughs> is everybody still with me? I wanna, I wanna just talk about one anecdote with Dr. King 
letter from Birmingham jail and really then uh, uh, circle, uh, uh, square the circle and just get back to uh, the, the present and, and, and really close. Um, in 1963, and I'm, I'm working on, on a book on this right now, 63 and the entire civil rights movement, um, Dr. King is helping lead a local movement international significance in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham is very, very important in this sense. We have a narrative of the civil rights struggle that says that it's only when the movement goes north in Harlem in 64 and Watts in Los Angeles that there's these civil disturbances and urban uprisings. The first one starts in Birmingham, Alabama in May of 1963. Birmingham is where black people are subjugated by the city commissioner, Bull Connor. They live in dilapidated housing. They go to segregated schools. And what King is trying to do there is not just desegregate public accommodations, but provide some kind of economic justice movement in Birmingham. He's going to be in jail in April of 1963. By May, there's going to be 1,100 students, some as young as six, seven, eight years old, who are incarcerated in Birmingham. We remember Birmingham makes global news uh, because the city commissioner, Bull Connor, unleashes German shepherds and fire hoses that are strong enough to peel the bark off of trees in the local public park, uh, attacking and punishing nonviolent demonstrators. Here's how King responds. King has his very famous letter from Birmingham City Jail. And in that letter, he's pushing back against eight white clergymen who are asking him to wait, saying, what, what, why is the movement um, in Birmingham? If you just wait, your freedom's going to come. And King, in the next year, is going to have why we can't wait. But in letter from Birmingham Jail, he talks about why we can't wait and how racism, Jim Crow seg segregation, white supremacy is distorting and disfiguring American democracy. But he also says something very, very important for us, especially the young people here. He says that the young people who are being arrested in the spring of 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, are one day going to be embraced by the very same nation that rejected them as heroes. He says that, that they're going to be embraced as heroes for, and this is the King quote, for bringing us all back to those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers, right? And, and this is very important because what King does in that one stroke, it's really rhetorical genius, is he connects the civil rights movement to our democratic origins, right? But he's also being too kind to the founders. The founders didn't envision Hillary Clinton. The founders didn't envision Barack Obama. The founders didn't envision this kind of multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational room we're in right now, right? But and here's where, where King's genius is very important for us as well. We've been, social movements at their best have done what? They've reimagined and redefined and reconceptualized American democracy. They've looked at a, American democracy as something that is living and breathing, not just something that is static and fixed. So in our own time, we have expansively, at our best, thought about democracy as something that is much more, not just inclusive, but something that's more, much more expansive. A citizenship that includes not privileges, but rights. And those rights include health care, education. Those rights include not being environmentally segregated. When you think about environmental racism, it's black and brown children that disproportionately suffer from asthma, disproportionately live next to toxic situations. King talked about that in 67 and 68 because he realized when he was visiting the Mississippi Delta, when he was visiting Native American reservations, where he was visiting where Latinx folks were living and, and talking to farm workers and agricultural workers, the conditions that they lived in, the, the, poor, the poor education that their children had access to, right? So King made us, and Lyndon Johnson by 65 actually says this in one speech, the Howard University commencement speech on June 4th, 1965. King was talking about not just equality of opportunity, but he was talking about equality of what? Outcomes. So when I say let's stop talking about diversity, let's stop talking about multiculturalism, let's stop talking about just inclusion, we're talking about one, citizenship, but we're talking about outcomes. Yeah. If we say we want women to have more power, 
and black women and Latinx women to have more power. We can't just say we're providing an equal opportunity and if they don't show up as having achieved, it's their own fault because their own biological problems. We have to say we need to see outcomes. We have to say we need to see outcomes. If we say we want more opportunity for LGBTQ and we want to see them present and we want to see them um, not traumatized and, 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 and fulsome in their beings, we have to say we want to see those outcomes and not just say, you know what, we tried to recruit and then we left them alone and they dropped out of the school, right? So what's, what's, what's important for us to remember is that it wasn't just Dr. King. For a time, by 65, we'd become so mature nationally that Lyndon Johnson at Howard University on June 4th, 1965, he sang, we want equality of outcomes. That's the next stage, right? President Johnson dropped the ball. I'm teaching at the LBJ school. He dropped the ball. King continues by doing what? King continues by making and, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna close in one second, by making a last ditch effort. And this effort is, sometimes we call it the Poor People's Campaign, but the Poor People's Campaign is bigger than that. It's a movement against white supremacy. That's what the Poor People's Campaign is. And when you think about white supremacy, white supremacy is something that damages those who believe they're white as well, as well as people of color, right? It damages them too. And we can see this in our current political age. It causes intense damage and the, the proliferation of inequality, even among those who think that they have what Du Bois called the public and psychological wage of whiteness, that they feel they have this privilege based on this skin color where their kids go to school, but it distorts them as well as us. And King realized that, right? That's why King says, hey, I don't believe in enemy politics, but I'm gonna tell the truth. When he's talking to the American Psychological Association in September of 1967, he said, it's not just that Congress is running amok with racism, this whole country is running amok with racism. And just because I diagnose the illness, they accuse me of spreading the disease. That's what King said. So when we think about where we're at today, what can King's lesson teach us? I always say three things, educate, agitate, and organize. And I wanna end on that. Education, we need to know the story. Everybody in here, you need to know the story and, and where you fit into that story. So we need to read. We need to read, we need to study. We need to understand why we are living the way we are now with such fear and division and inequality in a country that prides itself on being liberty's surest guardian domestically and abroad. We need to understand that. We also need to understand where we've gotten it right. And this is where I think about hope. This might not have sounded like it, but this is an optimistic talk. And the reason why the optimism is there is that I think you get optimism when you have a realistic understanding of the depth and breadth of the challenge you face. Doesn't mean that you can't overcome it, but you realize that, hey, at times it might seem like we're Sisyphus and we're, we're, we're putting that boulder up the hill only to have it come back down, but this is a challenge that is for long distance runners. This is a marathon. We're not gonna finish this in our lifetimes. It's not a 100 yard dash, right? It's a marathon, but if we tell the truth, we're gonna provide tools for others. We're gonna provide that service oriented leadership that we can pass the baton to a new generation, but generations that understand the depth and breadth of the problem. Ferguson, Missouri in 2014-15 is symptomatic of a larger problem, and it's part, part of that problem is not sharing the story. Some civil rights activists came to Ferguson and they were being booed, and they were surprised. Why are they being booed? Well, they were being booed because they were telling young black people in Ferguson a story of success in the civil rights movement that didn't align with their experiences. These were teenagers in Ferguson, preteens, right? People were wondering why they destroyed the quick, quick mark. If you went down to Ferguson, if you saw them being interviewed, if you talked to them, these were young black children, many of them who had rotting teeth, and I'll say it again, rotting teeth because they had no health care in the richest country in the world in 2014, 2015. Many of them had parents who were connected to the criminal justice system, parole, probation, inside. 
So when you told them that, hey, we won, <laughs> this is our victory lap, Dr. King saved us, they booed and they were angry and they had a right to be angry and they had a right to boo. And what Dr. King told us about riots, he said riots or civil disturbances, urban rebellions, were the language of the unheard. That's what he called it, right? So they made their voices heard, not just in Ferguson, but also in Baltimore, but we have to understand, we haven't shared with them the story. The reason why they are not listening is because we're not, we're not facing the depth and breadth of our current reality. So I wanna close by saying this. When we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when we think about the heroic period of the civil rights movement, um, we, we could talk about the, the, the assassination of Emmett Till, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, 381 days, 1955 to 56. Uh, Emmett Till is August 28, 1955. Little Rock Central High School, 1957. 1960 is February 1st and the start of the sit-in movements. 1961 are the Freedom Rides and Congressman John Lewis is going to be physically assaulted uh, May 14th, 1961, outside of Anniston, Alabama. The trailways and the Greyhound buses are, are burning. FBI knew white supremacists were going to firebomb those buses, but they did nothing to intervene because J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, was a white supremacist. 1962, James Meredith becomes the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. Oxford, it convulses in violence that leaves people dead three days over the, the appearance of one black student at Ole Miss. 1963 is the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's also the spring of Birmingham, Alabama. June 11, 1963, John F. Kennedy makes his very famous civil rights speech where he supports the movement and says that it's a moral issue. A few hours later, Medgar Evers is assassinated in Mississippi, in Jackson, Mississippi, by Byron de la Beckwith, who won't go to prison for over two more decades uh, because white supremacists in Mississippi uh, will not allow him to be incarcerated for the assassination of Medgar Evers. August 28th of that year is gonna be the March on Washington, which we think of as a victory lap, but by September 15th of that year, the four African-American little girls, 11, 12, 13, are going to be blown up in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And of course, there's the Kennedy assassination, November 22nd. 1964, the Civil Rights Act is passed July 2nd, but it's passed in the wake of the murders of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, three civil rights activists, two white, one black, who are murdered in, in, in Mississippi during Freedom Summer. And Freedom Summer is just an effort by about uh, 1,500 um, black but a, a large white volunteer contingent to bring small d democracy to Mississippi and the state of Mississippi responds by buying a tank and murdering civil rights uh, demonstrators. 1965 we think of Selma, Alabama and the Edmund Pettus Bridge which Carla talked about. You think about March 7th, uh, Bloody Sunday where 500 uh, 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 Alabama state troopers, including some on mounted horseback um, with batons and electronic, uh, electrified uh, cattle prods, um, really raise a, a, a peaceful uh, civil rights demonstration. Um, by March 9th, King is in town, turnaround Tuesday. By March 15th, LBJ uh, does his We Shall Overcome speech, the joint address to Congress. And March 21st to March 25th, King leads that Selma to Montgomery demonstration. And that, that speech he gives on March 25th is the last nationalized speech that King gave. King gave two televised addresses that, that people watch. One is the March on Washington, August 28th, 1963. The last is, 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 is March 25th, 1965. And, and, and when we think about King in that context and, and then the passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, August 6, 1965, and then, of course, the Watts Rebellion. But when we think about King in 1965, even before we think about him as this, 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 this nonviolent preacher uh, talking about the beloved community, in that speech, he's defiant. And what he says in that speech in, in Montgomery is that this is not the end, that even if there's voting rights, that this movement must continue because there is so much injustice right here in the United States. And he was talking about that in 1965, in 1965, 55 years ago, right? So, so the, 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 
one of the things he says at the March on Washington is, is leaving that march with this faith, right? And he says, with this faith, struggle together, go to jail together, but we're gonna, we're gonna reimagine and reconceptualize American democracy together. I think that in our own time, in 2020, we can do no less, it's just that the architects of that reimagining are gonna look even more um, different than in King's time. They're gonna be queer, they're gonna be Latinx, they're gonna be black, they're gonna be brown, they're gonna be poor people, they're gonna be people who are formerly incarcerated, they're gonna be undocumented and non-able bodied. That's what he meant by the beloved community and that's very challenging for all of us, okay? Even people of color. For men, it's challenging because we don't want to give up our patriarchal authority, right? For people who are well off, it's challenging because they don't want to give up the prerogatives of citizenship that are connected to their wealth. For the able-bodied, it's going to be challenging. For all of us, it's going to be challenging. But the hope, and here's where I end on hope, the hope is that in that challenge, we are able to reconstruct our society. And certainly the hearts and minds that King talked about, but King talked about reconstructing hearts and minds and institutions because that was the only way we could transform not just American civil society, but the world and construct that beloved community. Thank you. Thank you.